Yeah, we're back. We're live with Tanya Machika and talking tax. And we are going to talk about something you probably have not heard about yet, the vacant homes tax. Um, <clears throat> this is a really interesting approach, uh, creative, if you will, not completely unpreferenced, I mean, un unprecedented, um, but creative nevertheless. And the question is whether it can work, whether it can be enforced. And Tom, uh, President of Tax Foundation of Hawaii is going to tell us about it. Good morning, Tom. Morning, Jig. Glad to be on the show. Uh, so what we're talking about today is an idea that doesn't originate, uh, you know, with uh, the uh, uh, city government, but it's in a it's in a city bill. It's called Bill Seventy Six. It started off last year, was referred to the Council Budget Committee, and was postponed by the committee in November. Uh, after a couple of public hearings with lukewarm, if any, public support. Tell us what it does. Uh, the basic idea is this. You've got, uh, you, you, you walk around Kaka'ako at night or, or somewhere where there's uh, you know, a, a lot of concentration on uh, foreign ownership. By foreign, I mean you know, people who don't live here. You see all these, uh, you know, condo units, uh, they're dark. And, and, and the, uh, you know, the conclusion that you get from it is, well, geez, a lot of these are vacant. They're owned by people who don't live here. They, maybe they come once in a while or something like that uh, to, you know, as a vacation home or wherever it is. But a lot of the year, uh, the unit is just vacant. And, you know, as a social policy matter, um, it's, it's kind of appealing to say, well, look, you know, we have a housing crisis here in Honolulu or in Hawaii or, you know, wherever you want to look. And why are, are we letting these people keep their units vacant if we need those units so desperately? At least let them pay something for it. So the idea um, actually was in a, uh, a bill in the 2020 legislative session um, introduced by our uh, our great housing Senate housing chair Stanley Chang and uh, he's very interested in housing isn't he yes this he is, is. This is primary subject isn't it and and his idea was to um, impose a conveyance tax uh, at 5% of the uh, the assessed value of the unit per year. Okay, so to give you an idea of what that is uh, in comparison to the regular tax rate. The regular tax rate is $3.50 per thousand. Okay, that, that's, you know, your house, my house, um, any residential house in the city and county of Honolulu is at three fifty per thousand. A 5% tax is $50 per thousand. So it's, it's expensive from the get-go. That's 16 times the regular rate. That's right. And what, what he wanted to do uh, was say, on or before the 20th day of each calendar month, every person shall file a sworn return with the, the director of taxation uh, together with a remittance uh, if you don't live in the house. So every month you have to send in a return saying either you lived in the house or you didn't, and if you didn't, you pay, you pay up. We said, that's not a conveyance tax. Um, and and, and while, while the, the social policy may be, you know, um, attractive, uh the the manner of execution just was just terrible Who, who's okay, who's so, gonna so that that failed it failed it, it 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 passed the senate uh it didn't get a hearing in the house now bill 76 in the city council or as was we didn't get to the end of the legislative history here but uh, bill 76 is different than what stanley chang proposed what what does bill 76 say about taxing a, a vacant um, housing unit 
Well, uh, Bill 76 uh, is basically adding another property classification for vacant homes. Okay, so you, you have residential, you have residential A, right, for, for, for people who don't qualify for the home exemption. There would be another real property classification with a rate to be determined, because that happens in the budget ordinance every year, uh, for vacant homes. So it's not specified how much. Right. It's not specified, but when um, the uh, uh, KHON2 asked the, you know, the city officials, uh, you know, like Tommy Waters, for example, uh, what, what they had in mind, uh, there, there, there was, there was, there was some hesitation. Of, eh, well, we, we, we're not really sure, but it's probably going to be like between one percent and seventy <laughs> percent. Okay, that's a pretty wide spread, Tom. <laughs> it is now seventy percent. I mean, I'm sorry, seven percent oh, okay. would be seven dollars, uh, seventy dollars per thousand, seven zero. Okay, which is 20 times the current real property tax rate. Yeah. So um, uh, that uh, is is going to be an eye opener number one. And and then it you get to the the next interesting question uh, about how you ever enforce this. Now, uh, let, let's kind of go back uh, for a second. Uh, to um, the transient homes, the Airbnbs. Okay, it, it's it's been a, a a situation that's plagued the city and the counties and the state for a very long time. Okay, the Department of Planning and Permitting ha ha has gone to the legislature and testified more than once that you know, geez, it's it's really hard to prove that you have a transient rental in there. I mean, what are you gonna do? You, you, have, you have to you know, stake out the property and see who comes and goes. And uh, you know, d d does it match the physical description of the person who owns the property uh, on their driver's license or whatever? I mean, I think that's what they do now. So um, uh, a lot of times they, they can get around that and, and catch the guys. Uh, if they see the ad, well, well okay. let me let me uh, let me just uh, digress for a moment. Um, you know, um, a year ago I went and had my license renewed, and uh, of course they they over bureaucratize it in in the license division there. But what they said was we have to establish that you live at the address you say you live at. And uh, we have to establish, um, you know, that for your license, so they can put the right license down. Uh, we, we need to confirm your residence. So you have to bring with you utility bills, tax bills, some kind of other bills indicating that you live at this address. And I did, and they were satisfied. And they do that for everybody. Uh, everybody wants to renew his license. Everybody has to show that. Um, so you know, that was that's pretty reliable proof, I would say that I live there. Uh, they asked for more than one source, man. The other thing I'm thinking of, and I'd like you to comment on, is um, back in the day, I remember that- well, but, uh, but, but does that really prove you live there? Okay. No, no, I could be fraud. It, it, it really doesn't. The government. No, but, the, but, but it, it, there's a certain percentage of credibility you have. I mean, it's not perfect, certainly, but but yeah, because because percentage. one of the points that 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 I'm you know uh, was thinking of when I uh, suggested this topic for our show is, well, okay, if it's that tough to prove that a transient rental's in the place, how do you prove that somebody lives there? And, and by the same token, if you are assessed a vacant home tax, how do you prove that you in fact live there? You know, I mean, there's 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 like privacy concerns for one thing. I mean, you you can't you can't. Uh, um, I mean, how, how do you prove that you live in your home? Okay. Uh, all right. So, so I, I I present uh, an insurance card with the address on it. Um. So what? I mean, yeah, I could have lived in lived that in that house, uh, you know, two years ago or four years ago or ten years ago. No, 
Uh, or, you, or you could you could have a, your utility bill delivered there in your name and and pay it, um, but it, you're not there. Um, I, this, there's ways to fraud it. There's certainly ways to fraud it. Um, I, but I submit that not everybody's going to be into fraud. I think the percentage of fraud grows when you go from one percent to seven percent. You know, it'd be a, a, a correlation there. At 7%, a lot more people are going to try to escape that tax. At 1%, maybe not so many. Um, the other thing I'm remembering, I don't know if you remember, but maybe it's not even a memory, maybe it's still happening, is you have a different rate, uh, say in a condo, which you, you um, it's a resident rate versus a non-resident rate. Uh, or, or am I thinking rather of a bank mortgage loan? Maybe I'm thinking of a bank mortgage loan. But, no, I mean we we have we have that yeah. we have that right now. I mean, yeah. if you if you own and occupy your home, right, you fill in this form called a home exemption. Yeah. And uh, if you don't have a home exemption, uh, and you're a, a residence, and and your residence is over a million dollars, you get kicked over into residential A, which is a different uh, which is which That's is a different right. rate class, and it's much higher. Yeah. Okay, so how do they show that they're residents or non-residents? How is the government satisfied? How do you limit fraud? Well, in in that case, basically, you you know you 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 file the home exemption application, and then they just take it. That's what they've been doing for the last uh, yeah, you know, no, sixty I'm, years or I'm, so. I'm that... Remembering, yeah, and it, and it stays that way. It stays that way until it changes. I, I don't know. You have to repeat the filing. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, you may have to repeat it after a certain number of years, but um, not usually. I mean, I've. I've. Uh, uh, I guess whenever the property is sold, you would have to do it again. So doesn't that work though? Couldn't you do the same thing here? Possibly, but that's. But that's not. Again, that's not uh, conclusive proof. I mean, some. No, some people. None of this is. I mean, all of this is subject to fraud. And I guess the question is whether the tax office or uh, the city is ever going to go after anybody. Do they have the resources to investigate? Do they have the data? You know, it's a cross-check data. Um, I, I will never forget uh, one guy who was uh, on our neighborhood board uh, was not living in the district and somebody took him to task on it. And um, he said, no, no, I'm, I'm living in the district. And come to find he really wasn't. Um, but his boss um, verified or authenticated that he was living in the district and, there, and the city left it right there. Um, and they accepted that. Uh, so, you know, I, th I think there's, um, there's ways that you can raise the issue, but it's not clear how it's going to be resolved. Um, and the question is wh whether you have the, whether the government has the resources to investigate, whether it has the data to investigate. Um, and whether it has to prosecute is to prosecute. And if the, well, penalty, I mean, if the penalty of fraud is low, you're going to have more fraud. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the things that they were talking about include, okay, um, let's look at the utility bill. Uh, we, we know how much water these, this, this person's consuming because uh, water, water supply is part of the city. Um, so let's look for you know, low, low water bills. Or, or you can have, you know, like something you see on TV. You, you can have an inspector come and insert little slivers of paper in the front door, you know, every little front door, and then come back in a few days and see if the paper is still there. If it is, you write them up. Sure, like the, like the chalk <laughs> mark on the tire. That, that, like the, the chalk the mark on the tire, exactly. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, the, I think ultimately it's a question of resources on the part of the enforcing uh, governmental entity and in the in the city and county i don't think we have the resources so it's it's really a paper tiger and the question i put to you uh, regardless of the ultimate um you know outcome for um bill 76 uh, is um how do we avoid huge condo buildings where you can see no lights where you know that although we have this critical housing shortage um, but there are people who buy these condos sometimes for millions, multiple millions. Um, they don't rent them out. And so this is this kind of 
the disparity between housing that exists and people on the street. Um, this is a serious problem, and I think it's getting worse. You know, people from overseas and the mainland, they, they invest in these valuable condos. They don't want strangers living there. They don't want anybody living there uh, because they, it's the likelihood is that tenant's going to be the tenant from hell and will mess up their condo. And I think that's the natural human reaction. I spent a lot of money for this thing. I don't want to have a stranger in there. I prefer to leave it vacant while I'm not here. I'm sorry. How do you discourage that or rather encourage renting because we have a critical housing shortage? What do you do? There's got to be a way to do something on it. All right. Now, uh, I, I don't think, you know, attacking it with the property tax system is is the way to go because, um, you know, of the of the resources and stuff. Uh, so here's what you do. If you if you really want to go after it, uh, enact a mandate on the associations. Ah. ah, so you you um, uh, you, you tell the association that it, that you know you have to uh, enact a a bylaw or a house rule that says uh, a vacant uh, a vacant condo is a violation of of, of your of your uh, declaration and you know provide appropriate penalties. Uh, like um, I, I live in. Uh, a, an, an, an association house where uh, we have a prohibition against uh, uh, transient vacant rentals. And that gives was, was the- Was that anything less uh, or rather uh, less than 60 days or 30 days? Is that what it is? Something like that. Yeah. And, and, and that, that incentivizes the resident manager to go and like scour the the TAT adds to see if there's any anything in our building. Um, and if there is, uh, you know, be up before the board, it goes. Well, the incentive to the association is that it can keep the penalty, right? That's right. So they, that's a, they, yeah. they, they, they impose fines and they can keep them. Uh, yeah. And, and the, of course, the, the, the state imposes GET on the fines. So they get that part of it. Yeah. Well, but is that is that doable? I mean, can the legislature or even more of a reach, the city council, force the condominium association to change its bylaws? Um, or could it enact a, a bill to uh, simply create that provision uh, external to the bylaws and just make it happen? In other words, um, if somebody um, has a vacant apartment, um, then then that person has to pay a fine to the condo association. Now, I guess it, it has to be it has to it has to be within the, the articles and bylaws of the condo association. Well, the rules you know, if if the if the uh, association already exists, it's kind of hard because you have settled property rights. Mm -hmm. But if it's if it's an association that doesn't exist yet. Then, then you can certainly provide for uh, what the what the bylaws have to contain in order to get approved. Yeah, now, but you're right. I mean, if the, if the bylaws exist and all that, um, and then the uh, homeowner says, "Wait a minute, I I bought into a unit under these articles and bylaws. Um, you're changing. The government is changing my legal entitlement here, uh, and that that's a kind of taking." It's a taking, I, yeah. I, I would fight with you on that, you know, and right. take you to court kind of thing. Yeah, that, that's interesting. But, you know, there, there are lots of condos that, that say in the articles, uh, we have the right to change these anytime. <clears throat> well, but, but that's, that's true, but it requires a, a vote of the members. Yeah. And, so that, and sometimes it's almost impossible to get. And the other, the other two other issues that hit me is that one, you're you're saying to the condo association, well, you got to go check, you got to you know knock on his door. Uh, I don't know what you do. <laughs> go see who's living in the unit, um, and and make a determination, the operative term, as to whether this provision of the bylaws is uh, is 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 uh, being violated. Well, a, do they have the resources or the will to do that? especially when they didn't think of the provision in the first place. And B, this goes to the Texas uh, 
Roe v. Wade statute. It's, it's you're deputizing, you're deputizing the condo association to make a legal determination uh, of, of the rights of a citizen. And uh, I, mean, I don't know what the Supreme Court is going to do when it hits that one substantively, um, but but there is the um, there is the case involving the bar. Did you read about this? The bar in Cambridge, um, which um, wanted to get a liquor license, and there was a church next door, and uh, the, the city of uh, Cambridge. Uh, had a, uh, a, an ordinance allowing the church all by itself to stop the liquor license. Um, and, and the Supreme Court back 30, 40 years ago found that that was a violation of the constitutional rights of the bar because a private citizen, in this case, a church um, was being delegated had, had, had legal control, legal determination power is delegated to it as a uh, vigilante. And, and uh, this is Lawrence Tribe's answer. Well, I mean, um, we, have, we have something like that now. Go ahead. We have something like that now. I mean, when you, when, when you apply for or renew a liquor license, uh, they, they do inquire as to your, you know, uh, your neighbors and, and their, uh, your neighbor's input is considered in the determination of whether they continue or deny the liquor license. Yeah, the difference there in, this, in the case of this bar was that all the church had to say was no. And that was it. It was not a matter of considering what the church thought. It's the church's rule, uh, word was final. Anyway, I mean, there are issues about enforcing, aren't there? No matter which way you go, uh, it's, a, it's a factual determination, a legal determination, um, an enforceability determination, and a resource determination. And I'm, I'm still asking you, is there a way to do this to achieve more housing in the marketplace? And to avoid this, this dilemma of uh, a shortage in housing? Well, I mean, it looks like um, uh, you really have no choice but to alter the marketplace, which is, you know, uh, when one way you do it with, is with taxes, another way you do it is right with regulation. Um, that may not sit well with some people, but uh, that's, that's kind of what government is sometimes, and that is you know, to what extent do we want social policy to override individual rights? And That's the tension. Different... It's always the yeah. tension, isn't it? Yeah. Always the tension. And different ideologies have different, you know, different places where the line is set. Um, so so that, that kind of factors in as well. I mean, if I gave you a, a city and county where the number of uh, homeless, the number of people looking for housing, you know, the, the working poor, if you will, um, doubled or tripled or quadrupled, um, and then I gave you a city where the number of vacant, you know, units and condos doubled or tripled or quadrupled. Um, I think we could conclude that we have a real problem. Um, and I mean, we may have a real problem right now, but uh, then it would be more exacerbated. And the question is what you do about it, because, we, you know, we're a tourist yeah, organization. And, and, uh... Go ahead. Yeah, we, we like in any like in any society, you, you got to make trade offs. Uh, the reason why you have your, uh, you know, your aldermen or your city council people or your legislators or whatever uh, is to attempt to strike that balance. The, the, the courts are there so that, you know, people don't get into extremes uh, that are protected by the Constitution. But, you know, if it's uh, not something so extreme as to violate the constitution, then government should be able to, you know, make that kind of decision. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking, I'm th the other thing I'm thinking about, looking at it from the other, the other end, you were talking about the marketplace and looking at the marketplace, it triggers the thought that, and people have talked about this from time to time, that, that we ought to have um, a much steeper capital gain or call it sale of real estate tax. Because some people have made extraordinary amounts of money just uh, sitting waiting for their property to appreciate. And Hawaii is a, a series of appreciations, you know? I mean, from statehood on, um, everybody sits and watches property you get to be a multi-million dollar property. They sell out and they move to Las Vegas and, and lead the sweet life. I don't know how many people I know did exactly that. Um, so the question is, uh, why do we let the, essentially the free market govern um, on appreciation? and let people make so much money 
on the sale of these, um, not only condo units, but uh, single family homes. Why don't we tax them heavier, steeper, with a state capital gain tax on the sale of real property, and thereby trying to avoid some of this the spin we have seen since statehood? Well, I mean, what what you're what you're talking about kind of reflects the debate that's going on with the conveyance tax. Um, it doesn't have to be capital gains; it can it can just be like the gross value of the property, which is what the conveyance tax hits. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, between then and now, uh, the conveyance tax has gone from like five cents per thousand dollars of, of, of uh, uh, actual value uh, to, you know, $1.50, which is, which is a huge increase uh, in both absolutely and in percentage terms. Now, the problem so, is that if you raise the conveyance tax way high, you're not taking into account what what the um, what the owner paid. You, you know, it's not a net a net out. Um, he just pays on value. He doesn't he doesn't get a credit for what it costs him or anything like the capital gain uh, calculation, right? And you think that's better? Uh, well, or, or... We, I, where I would get into it is um, you can't make a million billion on a residence here, because that that what that does is it raises. Uh, appreciation all over town it raises values all over town um and the average well, guy if you're if you're house. yeah well if you're if your um complaint is with the value then it's not a with the gain so so uh, if you're complaining with the value tax the value that's what the conveyance tax does okay and, and that it doesn't you don't have to well you do you have to sell it to be subject to the conveyance tax Right. I would look for I would look for a way to um, you know avoid this appreciation scenario, appreciation and and leave town scenario, and I would have I would look for a way to avoid um, you know appraised values getting so high that the average working stiff can never afford a house. This, you know how many people leave town because they can't afford a house. And know many students, you know, leave and never come back because they can't afford a house. Well, I mean, that's 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 partially a market problem. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, necessarily have to do with uh, whether a given person is making or losing money. Uh, it's just a, it's just a function of supply and demand sometimes. Yeah. So you, well, so you and have the to... government doesn't really step in on that. <laughs> the government's not doing anything to <clears throat> avoid the, the spin problem. Yeah, so uh, I guess w w what you would want to do is, you know, focus more heavily on, you know, what what is the evil that you want to to dissuade, and you know, try to discriminate that from you know other, uh, you know, free market outcomes that you that that you don't want the government to get involved. in. Well, I think there's two things they are becoming more pronounced. One, as you properly identified, um, is the notion that there are, vac there are vacancies and, and, uh, and the problem of uh, lots of homeless, lots of vacancies. Um, the, and the second, or houseless, whatever. And the second one, which I identified, is, is the notion that um, property values, appraised values, it's all the entire real estate community is looking to push values up. I mean, it's in their interest to do that. And meanwhile, the average person can't afford a house. Um, anyway, uh, I mean, I don't think we're gonna solve those right away because from a political point of view, uh, the people who you know could speak on those subjects are interested in maintaining this, this status quo. But let's, let's look at uh, the Bill 76. You said in your write-up that uh, it may be coming back. It, it, it didn't do very well in the city council, but it, it may be now still under consideration. What's yeah, that's, the status that's, of it? That, that's, that's what it is. Um, it was previously deferred by the, uh, the city council budget committee, but uh, there's been a push to, to bring it back uh, you know, center stage. So uh, it may get unpostponed and, uh, uh, and the city council may be taking it up again. So uh, that's, that's what the... Uh, K2N2 write-up was all about, and that's uh, we're probably going to be taking a look at this issue again. You know, probably not only in the city council, but also in the in the state legislature, because I, I don't think uh, I don't think our legislators are through with the concept of, of a vacant homes tax yet. 
No, but uh, your point is well taken to say that um, the practical problem of enforcing it, however you structure it, um, it could be a, a showstop and create problems for government. And uh, you want whatever the bill is, you want it to work. Um, there's nothing so discouraging as a bill that doesn't work. Right. So um, uh, one one thing, just to, so I can get my head clear on this. So the bill comes up in the city council or similar in, in the state uh, legislature. Who's going to be testifying? What I mean is, what are the interest groups that would um, want to speak to this bill? Uh, how strong are they? What would they say? Can you, can you Im imagine a, a hearing room? Who would be there? What would they be saying? Well, if you, if you have uh, people interested in the social policy, um, you know, people advocating that that particular social policy would be there. Um, the realtors would probably want to weigh in because uh, their livelihood is going to be impacted by this. Um, of course, the government agency would weigh in in terms of uh, what, what what they can implement and what they can't. Um, th those, I think, are your primary uh, participants in, in, in this type of hearing. Yeah. What, what, what position has uh, has the, the governor taken? What position has the mayor taken? Um, I, I, in, in the hearings on the bill so far, there really hasn't been a whole lot of testimony. Um, and, I, and I think the uh, Department of Planning and Permitting went, went on record as saying uh, that it would be tough to enforce. But, you know, um, what, what, they, what they say and what gets enacted may, you know, may not be the, the same thing. One, one last question, Tom, and I'll tell you, uh, I mean, uh, this is not my, 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 my world, but suppose I owned a condo and it was empty right now. Uh, whatever the tax was, um, I would be concerned that if I rented it to a stranger, um, I could easily, easily get a tenant who would bust the place up. Right. What what uh, what comfort can we, the community, or anyone, a private organization, I don't know, maybe an insurance company, somebody, give to me to assure me, make me comfortable uh, that if that happens, uh, my my place will 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 be repaired. Either it will not be busted up or it will be repaired. How well, there can are several, I be, go ahead? There there, there are several. Uh, property management organizations that claim to do just that. So, uh, so use the services of one of them. Uh, they'll take a cut of your rent, but uh, uh, I, I think they are there to uh, at least uh, help with the cleanup if something goes wrong. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. Uh, the better the property management company, the better the coverage, and of course, the better the property management company, the more expensive the property management fees and, and that that that's all appropriate in the marketplace i think one one interesting point is that the um the, the property manager would want some comfort from the tenant and there's two ways to get that comfort one, one is he could say to the tenant uh, he could vet the tenant very carefully he said i'm going to look at your you know your background if i find that you busted any other place up here or anywhere in the world you're not getting in um, or B, uh, theoretically, he could say, I want a great big security deposit to cover any damage. But you yeah, know, I think both of those devices are, are employed now. That's limited. The amount of the security deposit you can get is, is limited uh, by law. And, that, and that's a weakness in the law. It means that uh, you, you can't get the comfort from the tenant, except by investigating the tenant's background. And there's a limit on that. Um, but if you ask for more than, I think it's a month or two, you're violating the law. So what, what happens where the burden, the economic burden would fall is um, it's on the owner uh, and he could soften that by getting a property manager who would be really careful. And um, maybe he could write a contract with the property manager that would make the manager indemnify or cover him in, in the case uh, of, a, of a wayward tenant 
and uh, get insurance, you know, to cover claims against the property manager for that. But that's pretty complicated and that may not give you the kind of comfort you want. So in the marketplace, um, if, the, if the owner of the property um, wants to feel comfortable, his best bet really is to leave the place vacant. And pay the tax. <laughs> and pay the tax. Yeah. There you have it. <laughs> there you have it. All, all an economic decision. Yeah, in the end of the day. Well, thank you very much. Tom Yamachika, President of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Really appreciate this discussion as always. Uh, we'll see you next time. Aloha. See you in two weeks.